Machine B reactor is just as much a product of engineering as a product of science. On November 24, 1944, B reactor's first irradiated slugs were pushed into the cooling pool. By then, the Hanford Engineer Works was the third largest city in the state of Washington. A thriving society of 40,000 employees quartered in barracks, the world's largest trailer court with 13,000 residents, eight mess halls, each the size of a football field, two grocery stores, four ice houses, a lumber yard, two automobile service stations, an electrical fix-it shop, and even a dog pound were set up to service this temporary city. A schoolhouse and gymnasium for children up to the eighth grade were located in the main camp area. High school students were furnished free bus transportation to neighboring Richland. All needs were factored in, including 24-hour patrol duty, public health services, fire protection rights, surface streets, 24-hour cafeterias, and weekly entertainment. All part of the critical morale effort as worker turnover was constant. People came from every state in search of work. Most were unprepared for the desert conditions, for the secrecy, the lines, the heat, and the dust made family life far from ordinary. I'm reminded of the fact that uh, the only way a man could get in the gate that the fence that surrounded that facility, women's barracks and the women's rec hall, was to be in the company of a woman. You couldn't get in the women's rec hall. You couldn't say, oh, well, I, my date's waiting for me in there. Uh-uh. She comes out here and takes you by the hand and leads you in there. That's okay, but not otherwise. It was actually it was quite an experience out at Hanford. They had big rest, uh, restaurant that uh, eating places that would seat 2,000 people. We'd go in there and sit down and they would bring food to us and if we finished cleaning up one dish, we'd raise it in the air and They'd come and bring us another one. On February 1st, 1945, Matthias himself delivered the first shipment of processed plutonium to the test lab in Los Alamos, New Mexico. The container was about a two-foot cube wrapped in paper and secured tightly with ropes. He was driven to Portland and went by train to Los Angeles, where he met a courier who would deliver the product to Los Alamos. Well, when, when Colonel Mathias met this other man at uh, Los Angeles, um, of course, the other man did not know what he was carrying because that was part of wartime secrecy and nobody was supposed to know all the parts. Well, Mathias knew that this was extremely dangerous and expensive and valuable material. So he asked um, the other fellow if he had um, booked a sleeping booth in the, tra in the train and the man said, no, I'm just going to kind of sleep sitting up in my seat. And Matthias said, well, you might want to get a, a sleeping booth with a locking door because the product you're carrying is worth $350 million. Well, in those days, that was a huge amount of money. That's about $4 billion today. And so it, is, it was shockingly huge to that man. He'd never heard of anything in his life that cost that much. And Matthias was, of course, referring to the cost of the whole Hanford endeavor. The science had been proven successful. Uranium had been transformed into plutonium, a highly reactive and volatile material. But would an implosion of an atomic fission bomb actually work? All that theory was realized on July 26, 1945 when product generated at Hanford was used for the Trinity test in a remote section of the Alamogordo Air Base in New Mexico. For the first time in history, there was a nuclear explosion. Fourteen days later, on August 9, 1945, Hanford and B reactor would forever be part of history when Nagasaki was bombed with the Fat Man bomb charged with Hanford plutonium, an explosion that was equal to 22,000 tons of TNT. 
the Japanese surrendered unconditionally five days later. World War II, the war to end all wars, was over. The reactor continued on producing plutonium to fuel the burgeoning U.S. nuclear arsenal as America became involved in a new kind of war, the Cold War. On February 13, 1968, B reactor shut down for good. Over the life of B, further testing, improvements, and innovation were commonplace. Its existence not only changed the way societies conduct war and peace, but paved the way for the new technology of nuclear energy, science, and medicine. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 1976 summed up its contributions to history with the awarding of B Reactor as a National Historic Engineering Landmark, calling B one of man's most brilliant, scientific, and advanced engineering achievements. Well, um, you know, when we think about preserving B Reactor, we think about why would we do that, you know? Well, think about any other great icon in American history. Think about the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell is old and is cracked. It's not very valuable all by itself, but it symbolizes to us the fact that we're all connected, that we are a nation, that we have common goals, that there are things we will fight for. The same thing is true when you visit Appomattox Courthouse, where the Civil War ended, or you visit the White House, or you visit the bridge at Lexington and Concord, where the American Revolution essentially began. We go there because we want to be in the presence of something that tells us more about who we are. Who dreamed something there? Who dared? Who presumed? Who failed? Who faced loss? Who constructed? And we have to do that because that makes us a people that weaves us together as a nation. The reactor is a voice for all those things. The reactor tells us something about who we are, what we're willing to do, what we're capable of and also tells us something about loss, about waste in the Columbia River, about loss of life. It has a lot of lessons to teach. So whether people are in favor of the reactor, think the reactor was a good thing to build, or they think it was a terrible thing to build and it never should have been built, I think all people will agree it should be preserved because if it's not preserved, we won't debate it, we won't learn its lessons, and its voice will be silent.